actually being laid off was one of the best things ever to happen to me because one, um, I did something wild where I said, I wasn't going to apply for any jobs. I was just going to create LinkedIn content to drive engagement and create a sales funnel for jobs to apply to me, essentially. And I essentially did that. I can go more into that if you're, if you're interested. I've talked to other people about it. But through that one, I saw the power of LinkedIn. So that was my start of like going, going on LinkedIn and posting every day. But then also, like I got my job now, which is at Humu. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is powered by Z by HP, HP's high compute, workstation grade, line of products and solutions. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Mark Freeman. Mark is a community health advocate turned data scientist interested in the intersection of social impact, business, and technology. His life's mission is to improve the well being of as many people as possible through data, especially among the marginalized. As the founder of On the Mark Data, Mark uses this platform to share impactful ideas via content creation, as well as push for innovation through consulting startups. In this episode, we dive deep into mental health in data science, and that's something we both believe needs to be talked about more. We also talk about how community, systems, and culture can breed resilience and success along our own data science journeys. I hope you enjoy this episode. I know I had a blast speaking to Mark. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast today. I've been really excited about this episode. We've became uh, familiar with each other through the data science uh, happy hour that Harpreet hosts. And I've, I've loved your perspective in there. And I just, I just had to have you on the show. I'm, I'm super happy to be here. And, and thank you so much for, for reaching out and having me. Um, uh, big shout out to Harpreet and creating that space. Uh, it's been so fun uh, meeting other amazing data professionals. And what a treat to, to uh, kind of chat with you. I, I think I told you this before, but many times when people go into data science, they go to YouTube and like you're one of the first faces people see. So it's it's really cool full circle of like me starting my data science journey and then also getting to chat with you. So such a fun time. I love it. Well, you know, something that I've really enjoyed hearing your perspective on or, or just just kind of like one of the affects that you have is you're really just honest. You're very authentic. You come off as someone who is comfortable with themselves. They under, you understand your faults. You understand the things that make you successful. And I really want to dive into that today. I mean, something we talk a lot about is, or, or I expect we'll talk a lot about is vulnerability, kind of being open with the specific challenges you faced and, and, you know, understanding how that can impact your mental health, your physical health, any of these things. Mm -hmm. Before we dive into those really fun topics, I would like you to get a little bit more acquainted with the audience by telling them first how you how you got interested in data to begin with, and then just walk us a little bit down your career path at, at a high level so we get some understanding of your perspective. Definitely. So, you know, I was not planning on being a data professional or, or even being someone who codes. <laughs> um, this came out of left field for me. I was planning on being a doctor. And that was like my career path. And it's, it's really strange because all my friends are in residency now and like going through med school. And I kind of just shifted away from that. Um, but my kind of data journey started in grad school where I did my master's in science in uh, community health and prevention research at Stanford Med. And so I was at the School of Medicine and I specifically thought like, I'll do this program, my master's, and make me more competitive to go into med school. And what I realized going through that program is that I did not like grad school at all. I love learning, but like being in that pressure cooker environment was just not for me. And so four more years of that, plus residency and internship, all these things was just not ideal. And so basically shifting my career, all my mentors or doctors to something new. So I had these research skills for clinical research. I can do statistics. Um, and also I was at Stanford. So I was around like tech in Silicon Valley. And data science has really popped up as, a, as an opportunity to like, one, still have the social impact that I seeked in, in medicine, but also like the scale of like actually impacting a whole bunch of people. And more importantly is like being embedded in like social impact and in, in medicine, like a big piece of it is like, I was really worried about the lack of representation of, of marginalized communities within data for like healthcare outcomes. And so I was like, I need to get involved with this I want to be part of these products and like shaping what this looks like. So it's like representative of like all communities. And so that's how I got my start in data. Um, 
just essentially just like being really interested in the social problem and seeing data as an avenue for my skill set. And so I started taking every single stats course I can get into and like, I was not good at stats. <laughs> um, like I, I went to Stanford, but like, I don't know how I got in. Cause like I was, I was just an average student. Um, you know, my science GPA was like a 2.0. Like I failed stats and math courses, but once I got into like the graduate level and really started diving in and understand like the application of it, it just started clicking and I just came obsessed. So I was doing my grad courses and then like 20 hours outside of school, teaching myself R and stats to keep up. A uh, big shout out to Brandon Foltz for his YouTube page because that taught me stats <laughs> and got me through grad school. And so uh, from there, my first job out of grad school was actually not even in data, it was in operations. And so I worked at a health tech company and essentially uh, in, in the Bay Area, we had this thing called Caltrain, which is like a one hour train ride to go into San Francisco. And I used that time to teach myself Python and I start automating all my workflows and operations and sharing the scripts with my colleagues and be like, hey, you know that Excel thing that you did that took 10 hours? I can do it in 10 seconds now. Um, so that was really cool. And uh, through that as well, I picked up a second job as a data analyst back at my grad school. And that was for, more so for me is like, one, can I do a data job like as a job and not just some side fun thing? And then the other component is like, um, am I good at it and can I enjoy it? And the answer is yes and yes to both. And uh, through that work, I actually got published for a couple uh, projects where I got to do R and stats and all those different things. And so from there, I was like, wow, I'm making more by hour as a data analyst uh, than my operations role. Like, what am I doing here? So I finally took the plunge and uh, quit my full-time job in, in tech to do a data science boot camp. And so dove into that. And I finally broke into the field as a data scientist at a company called Veron Health, where I work with like massive electronic health record data sets. We had like 80% of all EHR records in the, in the US for ophthalmology. And that was like only a subset, so like billions of records really thrown into the deep end. Um, and to be honest, that was my first data role and it was a really intense role. And I think I made a lot of mistakes <laughs> looking back now, like almost two years, I'm like, huh, I could have definitely handled some things better, but like as a newbie, of course I'm gonna make those mistakes. Those mistakes though really define how I approach solving problems now. So I'm like super thankful of making those, kind of getting those bruises. But eventually I think eight months into that job, pandemic hit and I got laid off from that role. And like many people are like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And like actually being laid off was one of the best things ever to happen to me. Because one, um, I did something wild where I, I said, I wasn't going to apply for any jobs. I was just going to create LinkedIn content to drive engagement and create a sales funnel for jobs to apply to me, essentially. And I essentially did that. I can go more into that if you're, if you're interested. I've talked to other people about it. But through that one, I saw the power of LinkedIn. So that was my start of like going, going on LinkedIn and posting every day. But then also, like I got my job now, which is at Humu. And it's literally been like one of the best jobs I've ever had. I've grown so much as a data scientist. And in this role, I, I focus on three things, building data products that reach our end users and like go into production. So like built NLP pipeline, built algorithms to classify users. Um, I do product analytics to support like product decisions. And then finally I do a lot of like data infrastructure for like our data warehouse. Cause we're a startup. We have to like <laughs> be scrappy and kind of build things. And so that's where I'm currently at in my data career. And I'm just having the time of my life. So that's in a nutshell, a quick, like I think five minutes of like, my data career, career compressed. Well, there's so much to unpack there. I mean, going all the way back <laughs> to the beginning, just the decision to get out of medicine. I think that that's, I had a very similar realization myself. So both my parents are doctors, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, they go into the office, they treat 20 patients a day, maybe on, on a good day, depending on, I mean, they're different fields. So it, it kind of varies, yeah. but the thought was that over their career, they have a fixed number of people they can truly help and see. And as I got into the do data domain, I realized that I could create one product and that product mm -hmm. could help as many people as they saw in their career, potentially in the course of a week or a month, or maybe even a day, which was mind boggling yes. to me. And it's the medical profession is <clears throat> unbelievably important, but at the same time, like if scale is what's important to you and, and your ability to, to touch as many lives as possible, there are other avenues to go about doing that. And you can still be involved in the medical profession 
you can still be involved at the intersection of the social side and, and, and medicine, probably at even, again, a greater scale, like you just mentioned. Something else that I, I really also loved in that, in that story you just told was how you did get introduced to data. It was this very, in my, it probably wasn't as clear progression when you were doing it, but it, it looks like you, know, you're, you realize that data is interesting to you. You started doing things on the side. You found a way to get paid to do that a little bit. You determined if you liked doing it and you could see yourself doing it full time. And then you made that investment to do a boot camp, and from there it was it was gravy. But there was a lot of of structure and a lot of like testing yourself and experimentation mm -hmm. leading up to making that switch. And I think that that's something that a lot of people overlook. I mean, I know quite a few people that get into the field and they don't like it. Just like you were in the same situation with medicine, you you went so far down. You have this sunk cost fallacy where you're like, oh, I'm. I'm already in my second year at med school. Like I can't, I can't get out of this. And I met some people like that too, which is like, you know, at Stanford top, top school for medicine, finishing up their residency. And they're like, yeah, I'm leaving the profession after like eight years of training. And I'm like, that's heartbreaking. And I was almost that person as well. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, to be perfectly honest, that can happen in data science too, right? Where you mm -hmm. go down this road where you learn all this stuff you do the boot camps, you do whatever, you're a year into your first job and you say, uh, this isn't for me. You know, maybe I don't work with people enough. Maybe it's whatever it is. Fortunately, I think within data, there's a, a lot more variance between individual positions compared to a more structured field like medicine or law, but, but that can happen. And the process that you use where it's a constant iteration and testing cycle and you're experimenting, I, I think is, is so, so valuable. Um, those are kind of my thoughts on that. I would love to hear more about the LinkedIn experiment that you did there. I really love that. That's something that, that resonates particularly with me. I, I'm sure it's going to sound redundant at this time. I talk about it in like every podcast episode, <laughs> but the, the idea of, I keep forgetting what I call it. It's either like organized or structured or planned serendipity where you're putting all of this mm -hmm. stuff out into the world and. And if you're habitually doing that, the odds that someone sees it increases and the odds that the incremental odds that the things that you want out there come to you are, are increased over time. And you had a very concrete thing that you wanted, which was a job. I'd love to hear how you first got that idea to, to just focus on LinkedIn content and create that funnel. And then a little bit more about implementation and how that worked. Definitely. So I think the key of it is like, eight months ago, I went through the, like the, <clears throat> the data science job search. And like, that was rough, <laughs> especially like your first data science job. That was so rough. And the, all the traction I got wasn't applying to jobs. It was actually messaging um, decision makers. So like recruiters or hiring managers directly. And that's how I got interviews for things, not through applying through various things. And so when quick, I had to do it again, uh, quick, shameless plug in a past episode with Jeremy Harris. He runs a, a, an AI mentorship uh, program for data scientists, and they have some great analysis on that. I, I forget what episode number it is, but we talk specifically about reaching out to recruiters or hiring managers rather than the formal interview process and the statistics around that. So uh, for listeners, short aside, check that out after this episode. Yeah, I'm going to check that out, too, because uh, because, yeah, that, like I quickly just saw like I was not getting traction. And so for me, I was laid off it was the middle of the pandemic. Uh, my wife had to stop working for health reasons. So it was basically I have three months of runway before I have to, my wife and I have to move back into my parents house. And so it's a little bit of a fresh in the middle of a pandemic. And so it, it was a pressure cooker. So for me, my decision process was why waste my time on, on a process that just doesn't work? I'm going to focus instead on kind of building up this uh, kind of presence. And the key thing is, though, like it wasn't like I just turned on LinkedIn and like that was like my first day. Like I was on LinkedIn for years, kind of on the, on the lurking side. But I built up relationships personally and then added them on LinkedIn. 
And that was kind of like the catalyst. So it wasn't like I was completely starting from scratch. And I think the key thing is like, you leverage your network. <laughs> like you don't want to build a network when you need to leverage it. You need to build it way earlier in advance, provide so much value to your network as much as possible, simply because you want to help. And when you need help, eventually people will come in spades just to really support you. And that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, various nonprofits I helped out beforehand, various friends um, who are now in the data space, or just other people that's had like cool conversations with, um, they really all came out and supported me, started sending me job uh, recruiters to come my way. They uh, sent me job applications, made introductions, but by posting on LinkedIn, it created a platform for them to easily engage and be aware of my situation. Um, and so for me, there's just, it quickly became clear, wow, LinkedIn is super powerful for really connecting the dots. And I would 100% say like LinkedIn, if you're listening, you like completely changed my career for the better. It's, <laughs> um, it's, it's been, it's been really, really great. So that's, that was the reason why it was like, it seemed like the most impactful thing. And I knew decision makers were there for a job. I just had to be seen. I love that so much. And it's not a perfect analogy but it's the first thing that came to mind, which could be a little dangerous. But I think the way you approach this, where you're, you're building something, right? And over time, it's creating value for yourself and for others. The analogy that I was looking at is like, that's almost like buying a house. And right over time, you're always going to have that house. You've accumulated that, that, that network. You've, you've set something in stone. Whereas if you're just going out and you're applying to jobs, right? You're sending out all these applications. You're doing these interviews. It's a little bit like renting, right? Because after the fact, what, what do you have to benefit from, right? Like you might've had that experience interviewing and that's a, like a very niche skill. So like, yeah, maybe you can get another job at some point, like you have a renter history. And so you can probably rent again fairly easily, but you know, is that going to be creating more value for you in the longer term? No, like owning a house allows you to either sell it or, or refinance off of it. It gives you so many more options. Same thing with creating this LinkedIn content. You have this network. You probably have a lot of things that you've learned and you've shared. You've built this specific communication channel that you can do a whole lot of things with. It's, it's a, a very powerful and, and you, know, you don't see the immediate payoff, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't, it probably sucks. There's a little bit more upfront cost, but I think, you know, we're both people who have fairly large social presences. I think we would both agree that being involved in those places, it opens up infinite opportunities. And to Definitely. me, that is something that, I mean, you know, it's infinite. You can't quantify it, how valuable it'll be. Uh, and, and something that's been really clear, because I'm starting to see the fruit of like, building these relationships after like a year of doing this is move away from transactions, um, the renting, like he said, and again, provide value because when you provide value, it provides an on-ramp to build a relationship with someone. And those relationships are just so key because you don't know when that relationship will help or you'll be able to help them um, in a meaningful way. And people want to be surrounded by people who like bring positive outcomes. <laughs> and so, you know, by having those relationships, you know, through my interviews at that time, some hiring managers became mentors. Others were like, hey, you weren't a great fit for this role, but like stay in contact because you're just so great to talk to. Like when you get more experience, like let's, let's restart this conversation. Um, and so like to go from this hiring process of like being a cog in the wheel of going through this like uh, resume and review process to instead like, oh, wow, let's build this relationship. You could potentially work here as well. And if it doesn't work out, we can still maintain this relationship to like talk about data. And I think that was just really powerful. It's like, again, relationships way more powerful than, than just a whole bunch of transactions. Yeah, you know, I think that that 100% bleeds into any individual work that you do, right? If the people that you work with, they trust you, which is, I think, a like a staple of any good relationship, they're more likely to, you know, to buy into the work that you're doing, the data that you're working on, that can go too far is that you, you're not skeptical of things and you're, you're completely overlooking things. But for the most part, I think that that trust and the relationship aspect within your work domain, it's not valued quite enough. And with data science, where you're sort of at the intersection of a highly technical and systematic field and a little bit more of a, 
uh, like a creative field, I think it's hard to understand where that line is between relationship and transaction. And yeah. I'm, I'm really excited. I'm very grateful that the data science community is so good at emphasizing and reinforcing the relationship side. Um, you know, again, like stuff Harpreet's doing all the podcasts, all of the different LinkedIn creators, the YouTube creators, like I like all of them, which is rare in, in specific yeah. domains. <laughs> yeah, I, especially I in the YouTube say, space. Yeah. There's like in YouTube, they have a whole like genre of drama, <laughs> which is yeah. absolutely wild. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't know. Me and Alex Freeberg still have some some ongoing uh, jo like joke uh, joke conflict, but that that's always a, a good time. I think we have some content coming out in the next couple of months too. So it'll be, it, it's fun to have as long as people realize that things are satire, that's, that's where it's yeah. <laughs> So I, I realize, and, and we've talked about this offline, it wasn't all um, roses and, and lollipops on the, on the journey here, you know, through, through, through your story, it obviously all made logical sense, but at each of those decision points, particularly leaving medicine, it couldn't have been an easy decision. Can you walk me through some of the things that you were experiencing and how you, you know, how you overcame a lot of the, the self-doubt that you were having? Definitely. I, I'm so excited to talk about this. I feel like I don't really have a platform to really discuss this as easily. Uh, and I think it needs to be discussed more is like a big reason that I left medicine was just for my own mental health. I, grad school, I, I tell people all the time, it's one of the hardest things I've done and it's really a pressure cooker. And I had some underlying kind of like mental health uh, issues that were just like, I wasn't aware of, it was undiagnosed. And then when I got into grad school, complete pressure cooker and brought them all out. And so um, I've, I've talked about this on my post on LinkedIn, but I was diagnosed with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, which, you know, when I was first diagnosed, I was like, that's not me. What? I'm not flipping light switches on off all the time. But then when I really learned about it, I'm like, oh my God, I've had this my whole life. And being in grad school, the pressure and not getting sleep and not taking care of myself really exacerbated. And so the best way to describe that is like with OCD is just cycle where you have an obsession. It could be something random. I think for me at school is like, I opened up a, a PDF for an article and in my head, I was like, oh my God, this is copyright. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense. I laugh at it now, but like, it was so real to me. And I thought like the world was going to end. Um, and then you do a compulsion. So for me, my compulsion, thankfully, is something somewhat constructive, but it was working. So if I worked on another problem, I didn't have to think about my own problems. And so it's created this cycle where I'll have this obsession of something kind of random that stressed me out. I would try to like push it down by just overworking. And it turned to the cycle of a point where I was just constantly working to try to escape my own problems. And I just crash and burn. Um, really had like a mental breakdown and it was to the point I almost dropped out of Stanford my parents almost picked me up to take me take me to go get help and um, really I, I, it was just like one of the lowest points in my life and it really I'm really thankful for it because when when you're kind of thrown on the ground the pieces are shattered you get a chance to really think critically like all right I'm gonna put this I'm gonna choose to put this back together again but again you get to choose what type of life you want to move forward and for me, it made me realize this level of pressure cooker, this level of like not care for mental health, I can't do medicine because men my mental health wise, it just wouldn't be a good fit. There's so many statistics about many medical students and interns burning out. Um, I think there's like high suicide rates in that group and like a lot of like addiction, all those things. And so for me, I was like, honestly, this is a passion of mine but I don't think I'm so passionate to kind of jump off a cliff with my own health to do this. And so I just had to step away from this career because I just knew it wasn't good for me and what my life wanted. And so that's where kind of data came in because in a way I still got to have that mental stimulation. So I got lost in code as a way to deal with my anxiety. <laughs> I got lost in statistics to deal with my anxiety. And over time, through a whole bunch of therapy and a whole bunch of support from my friends and family, you know, I was able to channel that like overworking. So I was like doing like 48 hour work benches, 
which is like, people are like, oh, wow, Mark, you're hustling so hard. You're doing so great. You're doing all these things. But inside, I'm like, I literally feel compelled to work and I want to stop. I don't know how to. <laughs> uh, and it was like kind of torturous. And so eventually over time, I was able to really channel that energy and be actually like, hey, you don't need work all the time. You can actually have way more impact. And so that was the biggest push. It's like data science provides this opportunity for me to really engage mentally and like step away from my life. But while also like over time learning how to like engage properly and growing in a data career. And so like, even though this is like a really low point for me, I'm so thankful for it because it forced me to think about like personal development and that personal development now, like you said, I'm very vulnerable. I know my strengths and weaknesses <laughs> because I've been forced to learn those. And it's been, it's, it's done wonders for my career. Cause now I get to think critically like what life do I want as a data scientist, just as a person. And then from there, you know, be actually critical and mindful, like how I actually spend my time to get to that point instead of just like constantly working, working, working. So it sounds like a sad kind of story, but like, it's actually really happy for me because like I had this bad thing happen. I learned from it. And after years of working through it and having support, I'm like thriving now. And I, the, the shrinks I gained from that is, it just helps me out so much and talking to other people about data um, and, and like connecting with people in the workplace. So that way I can actually like build things that actually help people um, th through data and, and kind of like the, the shining point for me where I felt like, oh, wow, like you've really learned how to, how to handle this. Or you like, you've really not like you made it in a way. It's like, I made a post about this and someone from the other side of the world said, oh my God, I have, I, I deal with the same thing as well. And like your posts, like they're aspiring data science as well. Gave me hope that I can be a data science too and overcome this. And like reading that I was like, one, I need to talk about this more because other people are experiencing this. It's just people are scared to talk about it. But two, like if I stop social media today, like I won. Like that, that was like, the, like that was just like the happiest moment to see like I've actually overcome it. It can help other people with this story. And, you know, it doesn't detract from my life or data career. It actually adds a lot to it. And it's a unique perspective that I think many people um, don't openly share. Well, so first, like, thank you for sharing. I think that that's one of the most important things it, it, it is difficult, especially in the public sphere to talk about the specific challenges that that any that, that you face that anyone has faced, and like, not putting yourself in like the necessarily like the best light, I think is so, so important, because there's so many people out there, especially within this domain, they don't feel like they're enough, they feel like the challenges that they're facing, whether it's motivation wise, whether it's um, like a, a, a de depression, de a depressive type symptoms, whatever it might be, they feel like they're alone in that journey. And that mm -hmm. is not the case. I mean, there, there are so many times in my own career, where I felt completely defeated, where I was yeah. completely lost. And you don't see that because, you know, the person who I am now has overcome all of that adversity to, to learn new things or to get to the, these new things, but I still see, I still, I still face it. And then every day, you know, like when I have to learn a new module, I'm like, Oh my goodness, look at all this, look at all the documentation, what a pain in the butt this is going to be. But I've yeah. learned from those experiences and all the things that I've overcome that I, I know I can do it. It's just going to be a pain in the butt. Um, I think that's the key is like now, like when I face new challenges, I'm like, Oh, at least it wasn't as bad as that one time. And I, I survived that one time. So of course I can do this. It's just, do I want to choose to put, go through all that? Yeah. And, you know, another thing I really would love to highlight is the importance of talking to other people, especially a therapist. Therap therapy has really helped me in, in sorting through a lot of the challenges that I faced, especially when I was really just starting out in the content space. I was going through a place where I, I, I was working for a, a more corporate job and it wasn't really a good fit. Things were, it kind of felt like my, my life was falling apart. Like I didn't know where I wanted to go next uh, geographically with my job, with the relationship that I was in. And as much as we try to compartmentalize these things, at least for me, they all always flow together. And just being able to talk about it, being able to come to your own conclusions. In my mind, that's what therapy does. Is he like, yep. they just listen and you, you figure it out yourself. Um, that was so instrumental in essentially all of the, I guess, like success that, that I've had to, to date. 
And uh, another thing that, that you brought up was situational, um, like, like your, your, um, the situation you're in, like that has so much impact on positive or negative mental health. That's one of the reasons why I'm so anal about like my workspace, like the routines that I have, the, the specific things I do when I travel and when I sleep and, and, and the, the systems in my life, because I know that once I start sliding, I can get in like a, a, a really depressive spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm not constantly maintaining a lot of those things and it is this journey that over time I've realized, okay, when I do these things, I'm able to, to work really well. I'm really happy. I, I have a lot of these different uh, beneficial like aspects of my life. But when I get out of these patterns or when I'm not in an environment that I like, things kind of spiral downwards. I haven't had like a, a, a major uh, crash in the last five or so years since, <laughs> since the one I was describing. But that's because I care. I'm constantly introspective about those things. I'm not ignoring them. I'm not pushing them aside. And that is such, such a hard conversation to have because looking in the mirror and saying, wow, like, um, these are some things that if I don't address them now, they're going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, is hard because you're like, you know, like, wow, I'm not, I'm not the, the, the person that I I thought I was or, or whatever Mm -hmm. it might be. It's, it's, it's so important, but so difficult. Definitely. I think, I think really want to highlight too, what you said is the, like the talking to yourself. And I think especially just kind of tying it back to kind of like a data career is that, you know, you're constantly learning as a data scientist or data professional. So it's like a marathon and there's so much to learn and you can really burn yourself out. And so one of the key things with like overcoming my mental health and, and, and managing it finally was one, I had to get really good at explaining how I feel to myself. So like, I feel X, Y, Z, I think X, Y, Z, right. And like really separating that. Um, so that way I can stay calm, not have anxiety and whatnot. But when you learn how to do that, you learn how to communicate to yourself, what your needs are. And so then you can start setting boundaries with yourself, saying no to things, saying like, Hey, if I do this, I'm not going to feel so great. Right. So like you need your space clean. But then after you start setting boundaries with yourself, you can start setting boundaries with others, <laughs> And that's where I think really where your career can grow, because I notice when I start setting boundaries with others, you know, people, if I find the right workplace, one, I find people who respect those boundaries and that's the type of work environment I want to be in. But second, that provides me space now where I'm saying, no, these are my boundaries to stop being reactive to other people's needs and more so in tune of like, what, where can I drive impact? Where can I be strategic with my time? Cause I'm not jumping to all these different things because I built up this habit of setting boundaries and knowing like, this is where I stand. This is where I'm not going to overcommit at. And this is where I think I can, we can work best at. Right. And so I don't think I would be able to do that without really going and understanding my mental health and like really focusing on self-development. I, I feel like I probably would have still been like a yes person saying yes to everything and just burning out every other month. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute, workstation grade line of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions, and I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z4 workstation. I really love that the Z line can come standard with Linux, and they also can be configured with the data science software stack. With the software stack, you can get right into the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. Yeah, well, I am still very, very glad you said yes to doing the podcast. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, this definitely fits within my boundaries and this is very uplifting for me. So this is really great. <laughs> perfect. Well, you know, that, that is something that, that has been one of the most like, monumental changes that I've made over the last 10 years is the way I view myself and the way that I like, like monitor myself. I know that sounds sort of weird, but a a huge change for me. I was, I was playing golf in, in college and I would go see this coach and every day I would come in, he'd ask me, Hey, Ken, like, how are you doing? And I'd say, Oh, you know, can't complain. I'm doing, I'm doing all right. 
And then he'd be like, why are you just all right? Like, you should be great. You're 21 years old. You're playing, you're playing golf. You're doing something you love. Like, like why isn't every day great? And he would get mad at me every time I came in and just said things were going okay. And you know, you're not, you're not like deluding yourself to that things are great, but you listen to yourself talk more than anyone else, right? You yeah. hear the things that come out of your mouth. And if you're for better or for telling, worse. <laughs> yeah, and if you're constantly telling yourself that things are okay and like it's like, ah, whatever. And like they probably will be. And your your mindset will be of that. If you're constantly telling yourself that things are going great and there's there's like opportunities out there and y- you have the capability to achieve the things that you set your mind to again you're hearing that and you're encoding that and you're you're like you're you're actuating it and uh, you know i am really grateful to that guy's name is bernie najar he probably doesn't know how grateful i am considering i don't play you know i'm not playing competitive golf anymore but go send um, him this podcast today and then that clip (laughs) let him know i I will and you know that's something to me that it, it starts with that how you talk to yourself and then you know that bleeds into how you structure other interactions that bleeds into who you are as a person, what you're okay with, what you're not okay with. And the, the idea of changing your identity from how you speak to yourself um, to me is what I've seen almost every single person that I deem to be like successful that I look up to um, is something that they've not necessarily mastered, but it's something they're, they're excellent at. And I think that that is a, a, like one of the staples of, of really solid mental health is like telling yourself who you are constantly and reminding yourself who you are. Um, That to me is, is just like a night and day change that truly, truly changed my life. No, that's, that's so awesome here. And thanks. Thank you for sharing that to, to learn that. I think, Again, you know, as we both know, being a data career, it's hard. There's so much imposter syndrome. You can really easily fall into that trap of like, oh, I'm not the smartest or I'm Because everyone's be telling you who this. you are, not yourself, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And then, then, you know, the moment we switch that. So like, for example, like, you know, everyone's like, oh, I need to learn deep learning or something along those lines. And I just made it clear to myself. I'm like, I'm, I'm just not a deep learning guy right now. And that's okay. Um, well, keyword right there is right now, right? You're leaving yeah. the door open. And there, there's nothing final about life, right? There's no finality. Yep. Like the idea is if you add yet to everything, it's like, I don't like this yet, or I haven't achieved this yet. Um, that doesn't limit yourself. It just mm-hmm. lets you know that you're prioritizing your time not to focus on it. Yeah, no, exactly. I think uh, thinking about prioritizing my time, something that's been really helpful of, again, like thinking about setting boundaries is uh, uh, Joe, from uh, Data Ternary, I, I talked to him about kind of like prioritizing, like how he, how he runs a business. And like the key thing is like, you know, make a list. I think he said, pulled this from Warren Buffett. You make a list of like your 10 top things and then you rank them top three. And then like the other ones you just cut. And <laughs> that's just been so monumental, like figuring out, all right, who am I right now? What am I gonna focus on right now? Um, and that, that gives me the confidence and clarity to be like, yeah, I don't need to know that right now because these are my focuses. I love that. Uh, one of my favorite books is called The One Thing, and it, it really highlights that principle. I think data science is has more similarities to software engineering than a lot of other professions. And in software engineering, we're constantly thinking about this divide and conquer approach where we're agile, we work in modules, and we connect them back up. In the real world, in our life, I don't believe that success comes like that maybe unless you've already made it as a VC investor and you can do that. But success comes more linear. After you accomplish one thing, you can use the momentum from that to tackle another thing that's bigger. There's this dominoes analogy where I think it's like if, if you have uh, 50 dominoes and each domino is uh, like 1.5 times larger than the previous one, if you knock them all over the 50th domino is the size of the moon or something crazy. It's like power of exponentials, right? But it works that way in the things that we hope to achieve in in business or in life is that if I knock out this goal, let's say my goal is to to get into 
to lose like 15 pounds. Cause I want to, I feel like that would improve my, my health. The next domino might be that I want to run a 10 K which could, you know, you're getting momentum from losing weight in that health domain and it's building up to potentially a bigger challenge and a bigger challenge. And that's in my mind, how we have to approach these things. We have to get to a critical mass with our businesses or with our goals or with our ideas so that we can ride that wave uh, and we can like let that previous goal chill and it can continue rolling. It has enough momentum in itself, but it also has momentum to, to drive us into other things. I mean, obviously that's what YouTube, that's what LinkedIn has done for a lot of people. And uh, it's, I highly recommend that book regardless. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, I go by believe, believe that like consistency will always outpace talent uh, because, you know, this talented individual doing like these one offs, you know, you'll you'll get these shining moments, but, you know, they'll burn out eventually or they'll, they'll kind of fade in obscurity. But if you just show up every single day, it's getting incrementally better over time, you're going to surpass a lot of people. Um, and, and I think one of the one of the best decisions I've kind of made in my life was uh, I think after I graduated from undergrad. I was working, uh, you know, working 40 hour jobs. I still do this, but essentially is like, wow, I'm spending 40 hours on someone else's dream. And so like, if I'm going to spend 40 hours, with someone else, I'm going to spend 10 hours investing in myself, whether it's learning something new or building something, wherever it may be. And so I've been doing that for years. Just at the very least, I spend 10 hours of, of just something on me and not for someone else. And the reason I'm a data scientist today is because I spent those 10 hours over and over and over again um, to, to make it happen. And now like I have bigger dreams and the same format. I'm going to spend 10 hours every single week um, until, you know, I make something bigger happen. And it's, it's not the fact that like I'm doing something big. It's literally like 10 hours of like, all right, learn how to write content or 10 hours, learn this new skill to help for, for data science. Right. And it just adds up over time. I, I love that so much. And there's that kind of rent to own analogy as well. There is that when you invest in yourself, it takes you so much further than just the current role that you're in. And I've never thought of it that way. That's like very new to me is that, you know, you are, you're, you're working for someone else, you're improving their business, whatever it might be. Why not just spend that time with some of that time or, or, some of your own time working on yourself. I know you're tired at the end of the day. Maybe you worked 40 hours, 50 hours this week, but don't you kind of owe it to yourself? You know, isn't, isn't that where, you know, your, your personal projects or your, your personal endeavors or your own goals are, are actualized. And the idea of spending dedicated time on that is, is something where, you know, I, I see why you're having the success that you're having because you're willing to, to do that work on yourself. And uh, I don't think it takes a lot. I think most people do zero of that. Yeah. And so- <laughs> You'd be surprised. Like, I tell people this all the time and so few people do it. And you know, they, they ask me like, how can I grow in this? And just like literally just spend even five hours a week just consistently. And that's why I was telling you like when I learned Python on the train, the reason why I loved the train was that it was one hour to SF and one hour back. And so five days a week, that was 10 hours just on the train on my commute, self-development. And that's, that's like, it's brought my laptop and just start practicing Python or I'll go read an audio book or not read audio book, listen to an audio book or wherever it may be. Um, and again, you know, you can find those little pockets of time to really double up. So like, say for instance, you're driving in the world past po pa the pandemic, you know, when you're commuting again or on the train, like one hour of an audio book to help improve your leadership skills or think critically about something that adds up that information. Yeah. Well, you can also structure your time too. I mean, that's, I read every night before I go to bed, I read, a, you know, at least 10 minutes, usually up, up to even an hour. And I find that is an incredible buffer to before I go to sleep because it gets me away from electronics. I read paperback books. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also a little bit bleeds into the conversation that we had before is the importance of sleep and how data, you know, I, I, I didn't bring this up earlier, but I think it's important how data can help us manage a lot of the, the challenges that, that we can have with mental health. I mean, that's something, you know, I, I went down that whole spiel of how, uh, how systematized I am, but technology is enabling me to do that better. You know, I, I use the mm -hmm. Aura Ring to track my sleep. 
I track a lot of things that I eat, how much I exercise, all these different things. And it, uh, hopefully I'll do a, a little project on analyzing how those match up with my mental health, my focus, the amount of time that I work, maybe even the money I make, those types of things on a, a weekly or monthly basis. To me, the data profession, while demanding the actual meat of what we do, can have a flip side of, of helping us understand ourselves and, and helping us really overcome a lot of the obstacles that and self-doubts and, and the things that are presented there. Definitely. And and kind of tying that back to, to my own work, I think I think this is why I love I love my job. Uh, I currently work at Humu, uh, which is a startup for uh, HR tech to drive behavior change within companies to improve like work culture or action management. Cool. It's it's pretty cool. So like, I build AI, you know, AI. <laughs> um, I build AI to to make people happy. And so like I'm literally using data to understand where like where are the strengths and weaknesses within uh, a workforce and helping kind of decision makers push behavior change to make people work better. Uh, again, using data to help people, uh, <laughs> it's so empowering, it's so fun. Like I, just, I go to work and I'm like, wow, this work is actually gonna ha- make someone's life happier. That feels great. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And the idea is you can use data to help others. You can also use data to help yourself. You know, just collecting data is often enough to start behavioral change, right? Like if, yeah. if you want to lose weight, for example, weigh yourself every day, right? You'll be aware mm-hmm. of your weight every single day. And like just being aware of it is often enough for you to start changing your behavior because you might not like it. You might like it, whatever it might be that's just like a, a simple thing that you can do. And then you'll have the data if you want to analyze it later, which I think is a really, really powerful thing again. Yeah, definitely. I think one, one app I use is, uh, I was telling you the, the Rise app. And you know, for me, sleep is so critical for, for my mental health. So I think everyone's different. They all have their different levers. Mine is sleep. And so it tracks my sleep debt. And it's really cool because it shows like, based on your sleep debt, like your like circadian rhythm, this show like when you're gonna have a peak of energy and we're gonna have a low point of energy. And so I used it to like map out my day to be most productive and also be like, oh wow, my sleep, my sleep debt is like way too high. Let me actually go to bed earlier for the next few days and really, really recalibrate. So yeah, it's, this is why I got into data. Like we can really help people. <laughs> it's so cool. I love that. I, I and, and that's something that maybe I, I got into YouTube more for the helping people part. And then I, you know, I obviously saw the value of data in that, in that journey. I think that technology and learning some of these skills are, are what is over time going to change the world. That's one of the reasons why I'm so adamant about education and and getting people involved in it. I mean, I I don't think that any of the research or any of the work that I'm, that I do on the data science side is truly going to make like, a substantial difference in the world. Like I work in sports for the most part. I mean, those might help with entertainment, whatever it might be. But on the content side, I see that if I help educate people, if I help get people aware of the field, if I, they realize that this is an opportunity, there's cool stuff in there. I don't think it's unreasonable to think that someone who has seen my videos might go on to do something really incredible. And if I was part of that, if I could help in that in any way, that to me is unbelievably meaningful, right? I mean, you know, I I think that I have certain limitations in terms of my time, maybe my cognitive abilities, some of these types of things to be able to truly achieve something that other people have not done before. But on the communication side, on on the other type type of content that I create, I definitely think that there is a chance to inspire and that gets me so excited to produce content every single time. Definitely. I mean, I, I mean, also at the end of the day, like thinking about like a normal distribution, not everyone can do them this amazing thing. <laughs> like, yeah, a lot of absolutely. people are just going to be average and a lot of people are going to be so far. So like, how can you identify those people by you scaling up your reach to empower people? It gives you more chances to identify those people who are going to be those like on the, on the further right side tail to actually make those impactful things and compared to like you just doing one-off uh, aspects. So, like, like I said earlier, like you're one of the first people you see when you're like on YouTube, <laughs> how to get into data science what is data science um so i i i can only imagine like the level of impact you have 
that you're not even aware of, but that is definitely felt by others. Yeah. Oh, and it's, it's a very exciting prospect. I, I just, I'm so grateful that I could be a part of hopefully helping uh, inspire the next generation of data scientists yourself as well. I mean, you're, you're an awesome role model to look up to. And I think that, you know, there's, there's so many good people in this space that I'm excited about the future of this domain just in general. Uh, on a slightly perhaps less positive, but also very interesting note, earlier we talked about how a lot of people, rather than us telling ourselves who we are, a lot of people are sort of told who they are or we're stereotyping people. And I think that has huge implications on mental health, but it also can be amplified by the specific situations that we're in. I mean, one in particular that we've discussed offline is being a minority in a space. I mean, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination, I'm a minority in the, in the data field, like ethnicity wise, but I have been a minority in pretty much every single sport that I've played growing up. I know how it feels to be the only one and the different uh, types of things that go through my head, the, the different level of confidence and those types of things. Can you touch a little bit on um, you know, how mental health intersects with the lack of diversity in the data science space. And if there's anything that we can do to improve the, the overall quality of, of the domain in like in regards to that. I love this question so much because that was another aspect of why I got into data is just like this diversity and representation. And I think first of all is like, when when people think about like diversity like they often forget like the inclusion component so it's not enough to like check off the boxes of like we have xyz this people and xyz that people right it's like all right once you get people within a space how do you make sure they feel included so you know you being an individual like who's a minority on the sport field yeah that that may feel uncomfortable at first but imagine if like yeah, that was the case, but they made an extra effort to make sure you felt included and it was known that like you were valued. And I think that needs to happen for, for all space. I think the past year um, has really uh, DNI has been a very hot topic for various political and, and social reasons. Um, but I think a lot of people are missing the, the inclusion part. And so for, for data teams, you know, really, and I think it goes beyond just like race, but like race, gender, identities, uh, backgrounds, you know, class. Um, and for context, my background is sociology. So before I got into data, I was like really into social sciences. Um, and so like, you know, all those perspectives are extremely important because like we're literally building tools that shape people's decisions. <laughs> and that's a huge responsibility. And we're embedding our biases within that. And so by having these diverse perspectives, and making sure people are included to feel empowered to share their perspective and not be subdued, you know, ultimately turns into like better data products, products that don't harm people accidentally. Um, you know, there, every other day, there's probably some article about some big tech firms, AI client going rogue and doing something wrong, right? <laughs> um, you know, how, how, how can we mitigate that? And so I think that's, that's kind of a key question is like, you know, Diversity is not enough. Is like, how do you include people in your practices, your practices and, and policies? But also as, as an individual level, you know, what are you doing to not make people feel included um, in, in a space and being self-critical? So again, going back to the mental health aspect of it, of like being very self-critical, like where, where am I missing at? Where am I not being an ally? Where am I being an ally? And really constantly trying to improve on that. And then to your other question of like the mental health aspect of it, just being blind, like it's lonely sometimes. I don't know that many data scientists that look like me, <laughs> um, you know? And some people even told me like, Mark, like, and this is kind of weird to hear, but like, yeah, you're like kind of like a role model for other people that look like you because like there's not that many people, so they see you. <laughs> and that's like a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, it's a little scary, but um, you know, you, you make it work, you, you identify people with similar backgrounds, you just go out of your way. Um, for example, like I'm doing through this program called Black Tides, I'm mentoring um, people who identify as black um, who wanna go into data careers. Um, that's really uplifting for me because like, I get to help people trying to go into data career, but also I get to see other people in the data space. 
that look like me as well. And so, you know, there's no easy answer how to resolve it. But at the same time, that doesn't absolve us from like actually individually trying. I think the biggest thing we could do is like being very critical of like how can we include others in our processes, in our policies, and just our day-to-day work. I really love that. And it's something that I've found unbelievably valuable on that front, uh, like the the connecting with other people, is that even in the the difficult times with with the pandemic, this has been a better time than ever to connect with people virtually. So the odds that I know someone that's a data scientist that's also interested in sports that also might like content, the odds that I run into one of those people in like my normal circles is astronomically low. Like mm-hmm. even if I'm hanging around with a lot of data scientists, the odds that they are interested in the other things that I am are, are very, very low. The odds that I find a group that I identify with online and can connect with and network with is unbelievably high. Like LinkedIn is a search engine for people that are like you or that you want to meet or whatever it might be. There's, there's a lot of people that value coming together and they should obviously value coming together and creating communities. And that's one of the reasons why I've spent so much of my time investing in communities over the last couple of years is because I would like to help bring people together. I'd like to help Mm -hmm. improve the diversity of thought and opinion within the space. And I will say within the domain right now, I think that there's an unbelievable amount of cognitive diversity, right? Like you you have people who have very different skill sets, the very different backgrounds, they're interested in very different things and, you know, like really, really weird stuff, you know, Uh, but, but like- I know this guy really into papayas, kind of strange. Yeah, what a strange (laughs) dude. (laughs) Who would like a tree fruit that much? Um, But- to me, there's another there's another step that you can take that opens up uh, the, the world, uh, which is, you know, differences in cultures, difference, differences in life perspectives. And that bleeds into really good quality work, because just as you said, you're understanding problems from more viewpoints. I mean, you look at some of the most basic uh, challenges that, that we've had with AI, especially with identifying like criminals for example, like the, the, the fact that those systems are significantly less accurate when identifying African-Americans as, I mean, that probably wouldn't have happened if there were more African-Americans that were involved in designing that process. Right. Yeah. And it's like, Hey, like, like these are things that help improve our models because these perspectives, I mean, machine learning data science is still not fully automated as much as Ben Taylor would probably like it to be. Um, there is still the nuance and, and the, the thought process and like the human perspective that shapes these models. There is art to this. There is uh, like, like nuance that machines cannot evaluate. And the more diversity of thought that we have, the more intelligent conversations, the more like slight disagreements that we have, I think the better. And yeah. Um, and I think and, uh, another thing I really want to highlight as well is that you need to, we need to also go beyond just data professionals. And so something that's really key to me that I learned kind of my, my research training, I'm specifically trained in a style of research called community-based participatory research, where you kind of like you're building these like interventions to improve health for like a community, right? Some in community health, typically marginalized communities. And many times the problem was that like these academic institutions will swoop in, do this intervention and get the research and then dip out. <laughs> and then like, all right, that was fun. Thanks for the data and just dip out. And this kind of changes that di- paradigm where like actually the people that you're impacting are key stakeholders in the decision process and in um, kind of like providing that data and also like sharing that data as well. And so, you know, I think for these tools, data tools that we actually impact people with, we need to think critically as well as like, how do we involve the people we impact in our decision processes? Because I think, I can't remember which documentary, but like the various like social media <laughs> um, applications is like decided by a few people um, who do not represent the world. <laughs> um, and so, you know, thinking more critically, like how I think people call it like human in the loop, but, you know, I'm just brainstorming right now, but like community in the loop, you know, how can you think critically about involving what's the externalities, the impact of our data work on others and making sure that we don't harm people. Yeah, well, I, I think 
that's something so value about, valuable about individuals making decisions and having personal biases. To me, that's like a, a super fascinating domain. A, a, an example from probably like the, the more recent news. I don't know why this has been on my mind a lot, but like Joe Rogan, right? He got COVID and he's yeah. like, I, I wouldn't say he's an anti-vaxxer, but he believes that I think young people and uh, like healthy people with low comorbidity factors, they don't need to be getting vaccines. And then so he gets it, he gets treated and he he ends up, you know, a couple of days, he's, he's okay. But his perspective is that, okay, I, I got it. I got all these treatments and I was fine. What he doesn't realize is that how many people have access to all the types of treatments, the IV drips, the, the experimental medicines, all these things that he has. I mean, if everyone had access to it, yeah, maybe those people wouldn't uh, need to be vaccinated, but he is in a very rare, unique situation. And like his judgments are based purely on his life, not on the, the broad economic landscape of, of the United States or other countries. And I think that a lot of the time in a large corporations, we see the same thing where there's sort of an ivory tower where, oh, in, in our life that is like drastically different from the average person's life, this is what yeah. creates value and this would be great. But we there's this divide between me and the group and the more dissenting opinions, the more, the more uh, people we have who are involved on like boots on the ground uh, processes and, and living in kind of like in Joe Rogan's case, like the real world, uh, that's, that's definitely a better thing for a process. And that comes up a lot in design thinking, right? That's, mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, the person that I, that I co-taught uh, a class with, Oveta Sampson. She is a designer by trade. And uh, a lot of the concepts you described are, are specifically uh, intimately connected to design thinking. And it's, it's nice to see those things research. <laughs> I probably attribute that to being at Stanford for a little too long because they're very oh, yeah, heavy they, on design they have a huge thinking. Design program. Yeah. And it's like embedded in like the culture so much and like how I approach problems and think about problems are very influenced by that. Yeah. I read a book from one of the professors there called Designing Your Life. It was a very interesting Yeah, the take blue book on, with the, the yeah. little dots on it. Yeah. Yeah. A very interesting take. Maybe a little too systematic for my life. I it's coming from a person who is very systematic to begin with, but uh, I, I love that perspective for problem solving, like getting to intimately know the problem, like getting to experience the problems firsthand is invaluable for coming to hopefully good solutions. Yeah, no, I think one of the first things I tell, like if you get into a new job as a data professional, the people I talk to aren't other data professionals or engineers. I go talk to uh, user research, uh, UX research and sales because they're the closest to the customers and it's like interview them. Like, what are the things you're hearing? What are the problems you're facing? What are customers talking about? Because uh, many times the organization is not going to send their data scientists to talk to users. And so they're the next best thing. Um, and through that, I, I get to learn intimately like what are the conversations they're having? Like that informs a lot of my decisions. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, let, let's, let's talk also a little bit more about that sort of... Um, corporate sphere, like getting into a data science role, something that I know that we have both experienced is like, we get into a role, we're a senior data scientist, we still don't feel like we know what we're doing. I mean, that's a little bit of imposter syndrome, but it's also like a reality of the domain. Like in my mind, there are very few people that truly know what they're doing. Is that your experience as well? Yeah. Oh, I think I, I was talking on one of Danny Ma's posts, basically how every single day I'm just learning as I go. Like they're, they're like, yeah, build this thing. I'm like, cool. And then I'm like instantly Googling. I'm like, how do I build this? <laughs> What's the correct approach? And I think, you know, maybe a myth that a lot of like aspiring data science believes that you have to know all this stuff. And in reality is like, you just got to know how to learn fast and apply. Um, and, and you learn as you go through, through that whole process. I think data science was a very good career fit for me because I am so obsessed with meta learning and personal improvement. <laughs> and I truly believe that good data scientists are just quick learners that, that are good critical thinkers as well, because tools are going to change the, even the methodologies that we use at some point are going to change the ones 
who are going to be successful in the long ones in the long run are going to be the people that they can adapt relatively quickly and communicate those findings relatively quickly and, and can, can mm-hmm. keep up with that tidal wave. And so I, I, I have spent a lot of time learning, but I spent just as much time learning how to learn new skills and like, you know, the most important skill in my mind is to be able to one, find documentation easily and understand documentation really fast. That's something that I've invested a disproportionate amount of time in. And I think I would hope it's paid off. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I feel like the the turning point in my data career was when I stopped going to towards data science to learn things, which is still a great resource. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff in there to first going to documentation. And what I found was like, now that I have the foundation going to the documentation itself and seeing like the raw kind of instructions, I'm able to solve things much quicker um, compared to like getting someone else's filtered view of like, these are the packages I use, right? And so, so yeah, learning how to learn, learn how to search things really fast. And then over time, you build a collection of resources that you just reference really fast. Um, so I have a set of like books of a long machine learning, a set of books for like Python, you know, a set of books for statistics, right? Uh, and I just, I have a problem. I've seen it before and I, I know the foundations. So I just go to that book chapter, <laughs> quickly read up on it. And I'm like, okay, this is what we need to do. Let's try it out. And you code it and see if it works. Well, I, I really like that. That's something I recommend for almost every beginning data scientist is just creating like reference documentation for yourself right? That you can easily adjust, that you can easily use. Like Notion's good for that. GitHub's great for that. Just being able to go back and have an organized system for solving problems that keep recurring. I mean, a very straightforward one is, okay, in almost every, well, in almost every personal project, at some point you're going to be like reading a CSV or you're going to be reading some Mm -hmm. JSON. Just like pd.read underscore CSV is a something that you could probably memorize really easily. But if you're just starting out, that might be something that you're doing repeatedly or you can just copy and paste in. That's something you could have somewhere, you know where it is, you're gonna be doing it a lot. Um, also, for example, like training models or, or model tuning, whenever I train a random forest model, I start with like the same parameters. I use a um, uh, like random validation to, to tune things in and then I use uh, like, uh, uh, what should we call it? A grid search to, um, to go in and tune specific variables. And like that process is mm-hmm. very similar. It's like 12 lines of code that I copy and paste in and it's like really straightforward. Right. Yeah. Uh, but for me to like, remember and type it out in keystrokes, it's quicker for me to search and copy and paste, yeah. uh, which I think is a, a very, very important thing. Um, one, one last thing that I wanted to touch on, I think we're getting kind of close to our time here, is the idea of, of time. So we, in data, we, I, I'm a firm believer that almost any problem that I put my mind to, I could tackle. But the only bottleneck or the biggest bottleneck for me is time and potentially like compute resources. And how do we make that trade-off between time and learning something, time and a project, and um, you know, what what can time tell us about being a successful data scientist, or how can we how does successful data scientists use time? I think the the biggest shift in my career, and probably in the past seven months, was actually finally zoning in on like learning how to prioritize because then you become acutely aware of your time and how limited it is. And the way I kind of described it to, to my friends was like, when you first start off in your career, you're essentially told what to do. And it's a specific process. And so the more tasks you get done, the better. Um, the next level is like, you're told what to do, but you figure out how to do it. Again, the more tasks you get done, the better. But then you start shifting into, here's a, here's a goal that we want to achieve and you're going to figure out how to accomplish it. <laughs> and, you know, again, you have a, have a North Star um, but there's different avenues you can go down and some are better than others. And then when you get to a more senior level, they're like, here's this overarching business need. You figure out the goal and then you figure out how to execute that. And that's where I'm currently shifting in my career. And my first initial shift in this, um, so like my, 
mine was like his overall overall goal of like increased data access throughout the whole entire organization. Uh, that's super broad, and I just had to figure it out, right? The first few months, I was trying to do everything, and I burned out hard. Um, and, where I was just like not being really successful because I was saying yes to everything, being like, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. Well, this is for this large goal, so I need to accomplish all these things. And I did not have time to do all of it. There was no time at all to accomplish that. And so I quickly had to learn how to prioritize. So um, Greg Cohio told me about the Eisenhower decision matrix. And through that, um, I essentially learned how to prioritize way better, like what's urgent, what's not urgent, you know, what's gonna be this long-term goal. And from there, through that prioritization, I make use of like, hey, I only have eight hours in this day. What can I realistically accomplish? And among that, what's gonna drive the needle forward? And so if anything, like time is less of a bottleneck, but more so a, a catalyst for a decision <laughs> of, of like, what do you use with your time? Because I feel like if we had unlimited time, we would try to do everything and we really wouldn't get anything done. Uh, we'd just be very busy, <laughs> but productive, maybe not. I really like that you're turning like time into a positive thing, right? It helps with decision making. If we have if we have limited time, we have to know what we can do within that time, and we have to be honest with ourselves that that about what we can can knock out and what we can accomplish. I think that also ties really nicely into the mental health health conversation we had earlier, where I, I'm a firm believer if I have enough time, if I had unlimited time, I could probably accomplish anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that takes the burden off of me from, you know, like, oh, I can't do this. It's like, no, I don't have the time or I'm not I'm not interested in allocating as much time to this task as it would take me. And thus, I'm not going to do it. It's not that oh, I can't do this. It's that, hey, this doesn't fit into how I've structured my life or my goals or these other things because mm -hmm. of this time component. And I think that that gives you a lot of power over time. And that also allows you to use time, just like how you said, is a very positive thing, is helping you to target in on what you need to be doing when, because it is a limiting factor. But sometimes, you know, like the, the, the paradox of choice, where we have too many choices and we can't make any, can, can be one of the, the things that prevents us from getting started in the first place. So I, I think that that's a, a really beautiful way to, to tie all of those things together. No, that, that, that was perfectly said. I wasn't even trying to do that. And there you go, just weaving it all together. <laughs> so that was, no, it was all, all you. I was just feeding off of what you were saying. So I, I think um, I, I do just have one last subtopic yeah. if you have time. And Definitely. that would be about one, what you're doing now with the consulting. I think picking up clients, making uh, not a transition, but, but finding time for that in your life and, and how you went about that is really interesting to the audience. And then after that, just how people can, find you, learn more about you, and, and potentially start a conversation with you. Definitely. So, uh, you know, I, I still work full time, but uh, with my presence on LinkedIn growing uh, and being consistent, and again, that mentality of like, I'm regardless, I'm going to spend 10 hours on myself, no matter what. Essentially, I had opportunities come into my, my inbox and email saying like, hey, we want you to partner with this, or we want you to do um, you know, this project or speak at this event, right? And the, and we had a conversation with one of those people who were like, well, what do you want to exchange? And it just clicked away, wait, that's possible? Like people, people are interested, interested enough to like pay me or provide services to me. Um, and it's funny because I was like, wait, I have no way to do this. So um, advice I received was like, Mark, to start an LLC and build a kind of legal and financial structure to facilitate those type of partnerships. And that's exactly what I did. It's talked to my mentors. And for me, like, I'm really into entrepreneurship. I've tried <laughs> building startups before. Um, they have failed. Um, eventually, one's going to one's gonna pop well, up. You, technically, you did just start another one, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, venture, venture scale startups. <laughs> um, it's a different beast. So, like, the advice I see my mentors is, like, one, like, create the structure. But two, like, because you want to build, like, this venture-backed company in the future, start small with a small business so you can learn all these mechanics of running a business. Um, and in addition, you can grow your brand uh, through this. And what's really interesting is like negotiating and figuring out how to collaborate people on an individual is way different than negotiating and collaborating as a business. 
and it opens up more leverage points of like actually expanding the pie for, for both sides. And so I create on the mark data. And through that, I do uh, content creation, uh, speaking, and uh, workshops, and then also do like data strategy consulting for startups. And so uh, through that, you know, uh, you know, first week of launching, I like signed two clients, which is wild to me, uh, where I get to do some fun stuff. So one was public. I'm I'm partnering with Super Data Science to help teach Python for the ten week course, which is awesome. super fun. And then I have another uh, another client where I'm just doing uh, technical blogs on the data science space. And essentially, the way I view this is like. You know, I I love my job at Humo, so it's like not me trying to like build this other business. So that, I mean, there is this building component, but I've basically subsidized my learning. I can basically write content for other people and learn about the data science space and get paid to do that. And then that money I can use to go to workshops. <laughs> I can go to conferences and it's all business expenses to grow my knowledge. And so it's just thinking smart financially of like, there's so much stuff I want to do in data science but the great stuff costs money. How can I pay for that um, on my own terms? And, um, and also think about like business models of like, how can I grow a potential product or, or service that can go beyond me, right? And so it, it wasn't me actively trying to do something. It is kind of like serendipity. Um, it, the, the opportunity presented itself, my, my LinkedIn presence is growing and uh, it has seemed like the right time to, to, to do something. And I'm having a super fun time and I already had the 10 hours blocked a week. So the, the habit's there. I just use those 10 hours on my company. I love that. Something that over time has become a very powerful force in my life has been economies of scope. So we talk so much about economies of scale. Once you get to a certain size, everything becomes cheaper because you're doing it at scale. The same thing, or a little different thing happens when you get to a certain size, it makes it easier for you to create like parallel products rather than the same product. And the idea that you're creating LinkedIn content, and that means you can also do some technical writing, you can do some consulting, you can do coursework, whatever it might be. Those are all like pretty similar. And it's just from what you're doing, uh, there's a lot of overlap. So you're doing the same amount of work and getting, or just a little bit more work and getting significantly more content, more revenue, more opportunities, whatever that might be. And that's something I think is unbelievably important, especially in a content focused world is how do I, you know, from the things that I'm creating, can I get more out of it? Can I get more miles out of them with a little bit less, you know, like the same amount of work? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons I have the podcast channel on YouTube. I have a podcast channel for like actual podcast platforms. There's a podcast clips mm -hmm. channel. Out of every podcast, we're getting, you know, six, seven, eight pieces of content rather than just one. And that has the opportunity to reach more people to, to do whatever it might be. And I love that that you're able to see that and you're able to start acting on that in, in your own life as well. I, it, yeah, it, it's a nice start. <laughs> Still trying to figure out, but that's like the most fun part to me is like, you know, in a regular nine to five job, I, I'm learning so much, but there's only a limit I can learn. I'm looking for these outside experiences to build skills that I just couldn't get in a traditional sense, like how to think about a business, how to scale your content. Um, you know, this is all self-driven. So it's on me on whether it fails or succeeds. Uh, which is super fun to me. That's incredible stuff. Those are all the questions I had. How, how can people find out more about you? How can people get in touch? Yeah, uh, find me on, on LinkedIn. Um, I, I try to post every single weekday um, and also like try to respond to all the comments as well. And I just love connecting with people who are passionate about data and like really figuring out how we can just do cool data stuff together. And so uh, LinkedIn's definitely a great place. It's Mark Freeman uh, the second. Um, and then uh, my website as well, uh, onthemarkdata.com. So O-N-T-H-E-M-A-R-K, data.com. Awesome. <laughs> I will link both of those in the description. I also saw you started participating in the 66 Days of Data. So I'm very yes, excited about it's that. it's so fun. I, uh, I did a whole like week where I felt like I, was, I wasn't commenting enough. And so I was like, I'm going to create no posts on my own, really. And I'm just going to ask people to tag me. I'll leave my, my thoughts and feedback, but also search content. And when you're going on LinkedIn, like there's so much like fluff <laughs> and like really unuseful stuff. You look up hashtag data science and, you know, hashtag data. 
And then I stumbled upon, you know, six, six days of data, which I've seen before. I've heard you talk about it, but like, it was just like a treasure trove of like all these awesome people just learning and sharing their ideas. There was like no, no, not necessarily brand, but like no selling point or, or um, people trying to like gain something from the community. It was literally like, I'm doing this awesome stuff in data. Let's talk about it. And uh, it's my favorite hashtag now on LinkedIn. And that's why I had to join it. Um, oh, yeah. And, and it's, it's super fun. Excellent. So again, like, oh, I guess a, fr a free plug for 66 days of data. I just finished my third round. I'm going to be doing a fourth round probably starting in January. And I would love for anyone who's interested in creating some awesome data science habits to get involved with that here. Uh, Mark, this was awesome. I always enjoy talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I'm excited to the, for the next time that we get to work together. Super excited. Thank you for having me. This was super fun.